So anyway, my mom's got a condom on her forearm, and this Jesus. kid about <laughs> five people down from me goes, too bad her son's never gonna get to use one of those. Because <laughs> everybody knew I was the like shy kid who didn't like, talk to girls. Just streaming down yeah, your face tears just your little immediately, condom on the just, <laughs> just <laughs> like, <laughs> and I remember vividly that I was like, I started crying, but I put my head up like this because I was like, if the tears could just stay in the little lakes formed by my eye sockets, yeah. then no one would That's notice. That's science. The problem is that when they fill up, then your head comes forward and all the tears come onto your shirt. And, uh, they stay there longer. And the bell rings and you just race out of the room <laughs> and get to your locker as fast as possible and hope that the whole school burns down. Yeah, to cry in the bathroom like yeah. an adult. It's time for another Pick Blast in Gym Class, and this week I'm joined by former NBA journeyman and writer Paul Shirley, who runs a writing collective in Los Angeles after an eight-year playing career in the NBA and abroad. Will you go just like a little bit about like, you know, the Cliff's Notes story of your life? Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. I'm from a tiny town in Kansas. Uh, I went off to Iowa State University on a National Merit Scholarship, oh, which nice. allowed me to play basketball um, for them for free. Worked my way into playing quite a bit and became an at least tolerable college basketball player. Uh, then was not drafted by the NBA, but I had to do kind of a similar thing where I just sort of like ground my way into professional basketball. It wasn't a world that I knew anything about. Um, I'm from a really small place. And so we did a lot of figuring out as we went. Um, played eventually for nine years, which included 17 different teams. Um, much of that time was spent leveraging playing in Europe to follow the NBA dream. And then I would make it to the NBA and something awful would happen. And then I would go back to the minor leagues or go back overseas and then work my way back up. Um, and that lasted again for like a decade. Uh, then when all that was over, I had written a book in the middle of my career that was uh, that was formed because I had written a blog for the Phoenix Suns website when I was playing for the Suns. Um, started off on a writing career that has led us to where we are now. Um, so that's a lot. I'm yeah. Like, it sounds very exhausting, honestly. It's yeah. just the travel alone. <laughs> a lot of travel. <laughs> that's what people don't realize about the world of being an athlete. It's like being in a rock band or something. It's never as glamorous as people yeah. think. It's mostly just the drudgery of like, we gotta get up at 3.30 in the morning because the bus leaves for the Jerusalem airport and now we gotta fly back to Athens and then we're gonna have practice when we get there and that's just how just your like, life this is. This is the setup. Yeah, that's, I've noticed that like, Honestly, my like athletic career was like I started in a really weird way, but I was excited like when the like the elusive um, idea of traveling internationally like to be a professional athlete, but then mm -hmm. you get there and you realize it's just like the like worst flight path you can possibly take, oh, yeah. and uh, you see the track in your host hotel and then you go home. It's like it's very unromantic when you serve people with reality as far as like mm -hmm. a, the lifestyle of being a professional athlete. Right. Because I think people like the idea that it's like, oh, you're just super talented and mm -hmm. you wake up and it, people feed you grapes and. Well, so here's <laughs> my theory, and this is not, <laughs> this is maybe, I don't know, I don't know how to classify it, but it's a little bit easier to come to grips with your own failings if you believe that the person on TV just has something you do not. Yeah it's a little bit harder to come to terms with like, oh, if I had actually continued to work at this, maybe I could have done that, but I really didn't want to work at it. Yeah. And now I'm only watching. And that person is did actually do the work. Yeah. It's simpler to say, and I see this a lot when it comes to being tall, people will say like, oh, well, of course you play basketball because you're tall. And I'm like, well, no, that's not, it didn't go that way. I didn't start playing basketball because I was tall. I just happened to get tall while, while I was playing, playing basketball. basketball. And could kind of tell <laughs> early on, like, I just have this capacity for uh, coordination. Yeah, and, that right kind of coordination. Like, when I was a kid, I loved baseball. And if you had asked me when I was 11 what I was going to be when I grew up, I would have told you I will be a professional baseball player. And then I just started to realize, like, no, I'm a little bit better at basketball. I think we forget that kids know a lot about work, what works well. Like, yeah. I could tell I'm practicing this piano and I'm doing it for 30 minutes every day and I'm getting nothing out of it. Like, it's going <laughs> nothing nowhere. Out of this piano. Whereas, like, ball sports, I could just tell, like, I seem to be better at this. Yeah. And then my body kind of, like, caught up and it all 
worked out, but it wasn't, the cause wasn't, I'm tall, so I should just yeah. go play basketball. Well, when you're a kid too, like the progression is so much more simple. Like it's easier mm -hmm. to progress better and faster and easier. And like the older you get, progress looks a little different, but. True, yeah, <laughs> and I do think like we just, we just forget that kids are much more hooked up to their own abilities than we realize. Sometimes as a child, you can be lazy or you need someone to sort of guide you into creating habits and routines. But um, I can remember vividly thinking like, man, I just, get this better than yeah and i'm when not gonna kid, say that talented. i'm not gonna say that out loud because i'm from kansas and we're super yeah you guys humble, are very right yeah, you, very so <laughs> you wouldn't have i would never have articulated that but i could just tell like this is i can just i'm gonna get this eventually uh and that gave you kind of that inner confidence and drive to know like some way this will work out somewhere down the road and well well like i'm just gonna go back to because like the thing that i like about your story is you talk a lot about like like the unglamour side of it. And a lot of that is the work that you're talking about. Like a lot of it mm -hmm. is just like constant every day, just like putting in the hours and it's not glamorous. And like, especially honestly on some of my training days, I'm like, am I like, I'm like, am I good at this? Right, <laughs> like, right. you know, I make these teams, but today. Well, it had to be even more challenging to me, your world, because it's, at least in basketball, you could be like, well, today I'm going to work on this other thing. Dude, to get old to be doing the same kind of thing yep, all sure the does. time. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, what, imagining like being a, a swimmer or a, or a long jumper or something like that where you just have to like do the same thing over and over is, that seems like prison to me. I so. was just thinking that at the track the other day. Really? No, I mean, well, it's, this time of year is really weird on the track because it gets super hot. Right mm -hmm. now, like my training group, I used to be in a big training group, which is helpful. Like that's the thing that I like about team sports. I had started with team sports first. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have a community, even if like, even if they don't speak the same language, because I have right. had training partners that don't speak English. Um, but it's good to like have a group of people like in solidarity. And so when I moved to Texas, it's like, it's pretty much just me every day. And when right. it starts getting hot and people are having fun at the lake and I'm right, like, you right, know, yeah. and now with the world of Instagram, I'm like, oh, you guys are all having fun without me. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Just raking the pit. I'm like, don't worry about it. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I went through that in that as I aged, I started to have a harder time putting aside the rest of my life. Like I, I didn't drink till I was 27. And that was largely because I was so dedicated to the pursuit of this sport. Yeah. Almost like to a, in a destructive way, like it was almost like an addiction Obsession, that I was so yeah. into, I was like such a perfectionist um, that I think I probably would have been better off if I would like gone to a party now and then yeah, and just had a date a little. once in a while. Um, <laughs> but I think as you age, you start to realize like, oh man, I've missed out on quite a bit that other people were doing and they, they their lives are starting and yeah. I'm now well behind them. I'm running into that now. Like I'm turning mm -hmm. 30 and I'm like, wow, you guys like bought houses right, and I have families. Right. I'm like. And it, it shouldn't be lost that, you know, we've had experiences that are incredible, kind of yeah. invaluable. And we've met friends that are gonna exist all over the world probably that are interesting and are gonna lead to stories to tell those people who are in, yeah, having their normal lives. In Kansas, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, how much, like, basketball is really interesting to me, especially when people play, play collegiate basketball, because I get kind of torn because I feel like as kids grow up in sport, I love sport. You learn so many different, like, valuable lessons about dealing with life, dealing with conflict, dealing with a ton of things. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's almost like you live like a parallel where, like, this is the only value that you contribute right mm -hmm. now as a person. So... When you go and play, like a lot of these overseas teams don't have a ton of resources like the NBA right, does. Right. And one of those things, like they don't offer you like how to live in an international country, like what you should definitely not do, mm -hmm. what you like should do. No like language, no preparation at all. Was that just like... Well, I think I actually, the one thing I took away from it was that they're able to keep things in perspective and know like, oh, well, look, we have a basketball team, but that maybe isn't the all to end all. And there's going to be other things in your life, even as you are here playing basketball. I really enjoyed living in, say, Barcelona and just getting to know the lifestyle of like yeah. longer lunches and the nap culture. Yes, and, yes, and the culture like is that. real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that didn't mean, I mean, we actually, in a lot of ways, we practiced more in Europe because we would have two a days just routinely. Yeah. Um, but there was that culture of like work hard and then go rest. Whereas in the US it's more binge on working and then binge on relaxation and nothing in between. Uh, and I'm kind of like you, like I really value a lot of the lessons I took from sports. I think the, the biggest one is dealing with failure. So 
sports give you this great microcosm of life in that every day, every practice, every game, there are going to be a zillion, almost infinite failures. Yeah. And it's a matter of like... It will never be the perfect right, scenario. You're going to visualize yeah. it one way and it's never going to go that way. Yeah. Um, and I think that trains your brain for coping with yeah. these sorts of things. And I think that's what a lot of times parents lose sight of when their kids are playing sports and maybe they don't get to go play college athletics or they're not going to be pros or whatever it is. They forget that like playing high school baseball was really helpful for my child because he learned how to deal with the coach wasn't playing him and how do I figure out how to keep playing through adversity. So when you were growing, like what, so, were you always writing? No, not at all. No, no. I was always reading. I was always, we were laughing beforehand about, I would, as a kid, go to the Topeka Library and our parents would let us check out as many books as we could. And I think growing up in the middle of Kansas, it was really romantic to be able to like be transported to these other places. And so I was just the, the kid who always had a book with him. Um, so I actually went off to college and got an engineering degree, mostly because I thought I would get to play professional basketball, but I also knew that was a crazy thing to think and knew it would keep people off my back if I was getting an engineering degree. Like that yeah. would give me a sort it's of like, backup well, you know, plan. People from Kansas are very level-headed. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Like, well, I can tell my parents at least that I'm getting this degree. Um, and then I had a friend, a one of my brother's college teammates went off to Spain to play professional basketball when I was a senior in, in college. And he would write these emails to friends and family about what was happening to him. And I was like, wow, he's like, he's making this fun and funny. And if I ever get to play overseas, I'm going to do something similar. So sure enough, I went off to Greece my first year out of college and just started writing these email updates to like 15 or 20 people. Um, and at first they were just like, hey, got to Greece and here's what's happening. Um, but I realized very quickly that if I made them funny, people would respond to them, yeah. like actively send an email back and then I would feel less lonely in Greece. So <laughs> just shouting out into the void. Right, like, I'm right, here, yeah. Like, like, no if cares. I crack some jokes, then <laughs> yeah. they'll actually hit the reply button. Um, and so this little email just kind of developed into a weird little list serve where people were like, hey, do you mind if I you know, add these five people, because I'm sending your emails to them. And so for the next three years, I was just writing these, each week I'd write a journal entry, like kind of a proto blog to friends and family as this list kind of ballooned. And I honestly can't remember how big it got, but it got to be fairly substantial. Yeah. Um, and then when I was playing for the Phoenix Suns, the team's web people came to me one time and they're like, hey, would you be interested in writing a blog for our website? Because at the time in 2005 that nobody knew what that was. Yeah, right? they're like, you're not busy. Yeah, they're like, well, <laughs> I think they were thinking like, he has a college degree, he's not doing a ton, and he looks coherent. He could probably string together a few phrases that yeah. we could turn into something. Good for you. And so they didn't know that I had this shtick kind of already built up. Yeah. And I remember at the time, even then, thinking like, this is my chance. Because I'd always thought I will write a book about this someday. Because I'd had a lot of other just weirdness happen in my career where, you know, just the, the oddities of, what it's like to sign a 10-day contract with the Atlanta Hawks and then get cut and go to Spain and yeah. then really get super injured in Spain and then come back and fight my way back into the NBA and then while playing for the Chicago Bulls have my kidney and spleen ruptured and almost die on an airplane. So like there were a lot of stories that You're were like, already this going is all into noteworthy. them. <laughs> yeah, I was just like I'm having a weird Forrest Gumpian kind of basketball experience. My first job actually was to go to training camp with the Lakers of Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal. And so I got to see that oh, Yeah, you're like, front. I made it. <laughs> yeah, and so I saw a lot of these things. Anyway, I had kind of assumed I would write a book someday. And when this blogging opportunity came up, I took it pretty seriously. And sure enough, like it exploded. Um, Bill Simmons, who writes for ESPN or wrote for ESPN, um, saw it pretty quickly and was telling people about it. And then like, I don't know, the Wall Street Journal was talking about it. And so then that led to a book deal where Random House called my basketball agent, actually, and was like, hey, do you think you'd ever want to write a book? And my agent said, sure, got us in touch. And um, that led to Can I Keep My Jersey, which came out when I was still playing. Like, I was still, I was 28 or 29 when that book came out. You did, you did have some catastrophic injuries that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Will you tell me about what happened in Barcelona? Uh, yeah, in Barcelona, I was, I had just uh, left the Atlanta Hawks, but I, so I told my agent, let's do it. So I went off to Barcelona and um, within, I had actually played pretty well in my first couple of games and the team was excited to have me there. Uh, and then in a practice, I 
caught a ball in the middle of the lane and put my head into this guy named Jean Tabak, who had played for the Pacers and the Celtics. He's from Croatia. His chest was in the way, and for some reason I was leading with my head, and that yanked the brachial plexus nerve out of its spot. Yeah. And um, it felt like it, like I eventually, the next year had, as I mentioned, I blew out my kidney and spleen, and that pain was unlike any pain that anyone will ever feel. But the nerve pain of this was even worse than that. Like, it was so extreme. I was just shrieking and crying and screaming on the court. I've met court. a couple, actually, I mean, you could have been para. There's a couple of para people that have brachial plexus injuries. You oh, really? Lost an arm. You could have been, you could have been yeah, para. Yeah, I could have, you what yeah, could have been, been, what been might have been. Uh, <laughs> I've, I just uh, yeah, lost I've heard my it was right absolutely arm. horrible. It, it was just this <laughs> searing pain. And so when I finally was able to, like, stand up, Anytime I would touch something, there would just be this like shooting Shocking pain up pain. and down. Nerve my... pain's intense. Yeah, and so what happened because of that was that I lost all of the musculature here, here, and here yeah. over the next like two months. It just withered away because my brain no longer knew that anything was there. Yeah, nothing was firing. Yeah, yeah, and it ended up being okay in that after like two months of some rehab that was pretty half-assed, um, I started playing again, although it was I was kind of an oddly shaped human. Like I had yeah, muscles like, here and like no muscles there. It's, an, it's not a common injury, but that's very common for that injury just to get complete. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just, and so I was just nothing. like playing in like, and it, it is interesting like the, the muscle memory that that is still around because I was still able to play even though I basically couldn't put my arm over my head, which is kind of important for basketball. Um, and then, <laughs> and so these are the like little things about being an athlete that you you don't have the big picture a lot of the time when you're playing. Like if I had known I'm going to play for 10 years, I would have spent that summer like really taking, like seeing the best people in the world to fix it. But again, I yeah, had, for long term. I had made at that point in my life like whatever, $120,000 playing basketball over the course of two years, which is, you know, $60,000 like, a year, yeah. right, is fine, but it's not, it wasn't like I had money to burn where I could just yeah. be like, oh, let me go fly off to Colorado Springs and find the best doctor. Yeah, for this. I was like, medical stuff So I was in Topeka, Kansas, like living in my parents' basement, like trying to rehab this shoulder injury <laughs> and then like going off to training camp the next year, not fixed at all. Um, and I actually, you mentioned that you're from Denver. I, I now go to Denver to see a physical therapist. They have great trauma doctors. Yeah, to try to like figure out some of this stuff from all these injuries. Like it's it's ridiculous how much you go through and how, especially in college, where they don't really have your best interest in mind. They're you on just their sort schedule. of like, They're yeah, you just time. sort of like move on to the next thing. They're like, oh, you got a stress fracture? You know what's gonna be fine for that is if you could just play, but we'll just <laughs> give you a lot of drugs for it. Yeah, and they're gonna be that fine. won't have any lasting impact at all, right? No. But when you're young it too, it's like you'll bounce back. You're like, I guess I'm gonna bounce back. And then right, right. and then you have like a flare up from that injury. Yeah, and like, that's that's another one of those things that's like it's it's really hard to talk about. Yeah, people don't like hearing that, like the unsexy parts of sport. And like even in your book, like where you complain about just the smallest things, it's like mm -hmm. the demand, the performance demand is so high. And even talking about rehabbing your shoulder, we're in a weird, like and maybe just in track and field or just the people that I've been lucky enough to be around, we're in a weird transition now where like people are looking at more long-term effects, even in NFL right now, like mm. with CTE. Right. Like we're like, oh, maybe we should look past the next contract or the next team or the next year because mm -hmm. it's, it's hard as an athlete, especially as a collegiate athlete, coming into like any sort of pro system being like, how am I going to make money? Like, how am I going right. to keep doing this? So, um, yeah, like the outside periphery is just, so, it seems so distant. And um, Yeah, that's. I think it's just, it's really hard to remember also for adults that we're talking about 19 and 20 year old kids who yeah. just don't know what's going on and are scared a lot of the time. I just remember that feeling of being a college athlete or even in my early pro days of just being scared. Like, I feel like I'm kind of getting taken advantage of and I don't know how to respond to that. And so the best or the most frequent response is probably to just shut down and just say like, I'm gonna take care of me yeah. and not like participate in whatever you're talking about. And I think that gets read by fans and people around a program as obstinance or problematic behavior. But in a lot of ways, the, the athlete's being really smart. They're saying like, I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to sort of stop. protect myself, yeah. yeah. And then we'll figure this out later. Um, okay, let's transition from basketball. Because yeah. that was That's not who you are now. You're, yeah, you're so much more than basketball. Long time ago. <laughs> uh, I bet you do talk about it a lot, though, all the time. Mm -hmm. Just being tall. I, like, what's the most obnoxious thing that people say about you being tall? This I think is my favorite game. I think it's... <laughs> How's the weather up there? Did you know that you're really tall? Oh. Uh, like... What? How? 
Do you think that I just, I woke up like this? Up, like, you're oh, like, oh, <laughs> You're right. This must have just How happened How did this overnight. happen? Yeah. So your career eventually had to transition outside right. of basketball. Mm -hmm. And now writing's taken off for you. It has. Well, I don't know if it's taken off, but it is definitely <laughs> the, still for the it thing take. that I do. Yeah. Um, and uh, that has been... Uh, I think what's the strangest about it is that it does feel like starting over in a lot of ways. And it, as you know, is difficult to start something over when you're in your 30s because, as we were discussing, like most people have kind of already started. Yeah, a life thing is, they're like point. in the middle of life. Right. And I've gone through, even I just turned uh, 41 a couple months ago. And I have these moments all the time where I'm like, I feel kind of like I did when I was 23 and I was just figuring out my basketball career. And I was like, then I was as I mentioned, living in my parents' basement and just like, I don't know if it's gonna work, but I th it seems like it's going in the right direction. Um, and that's kind of how I felt about writing these last five years or so. I feel like I have a better handle on a system now, which is important. I think I, in basketball, once I kind of figured out like, here's what I need to do every day, and here's the trajectory of things, yeah. I felt pretty comfortable and confident that that was gonna work out. And I now feel that sort of similarly with it's writing. It's taking shape. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> I think the tricky thing about writing in general is that, like, with sports, if you jump further than your competitor, then you're better than she is at long jump. Yeah, it's pretty objective, jump, right? yeah, which is nice. Um, in writing books, like, I could write a book that's four times as good as the person next to me, and one four hundred millionth of the people will read it, because there's just different tastes and it's yeah. very subjective. And so it has taken me a long time to understand that that's always going to be the case and to try to disassociate myself from like the quality, <laughs> yeah, the quality being necessarily related to success yeah, uh, and that it's more about process. And what's cool about that, I think, and you can probably relate to this, is that I think people assume about sports that playing the game or competing is the most fun thing. I loved the day-to-day -day of the improvement, of just feeling that sense of like, oh man, you know, I came into the gym today and I couldn't do this thing, and by the time I left, I could. Yeah. And that feels really good. It feels like you're at least making progress in your life. Um, and so it's been cool in writing to be able to reconnect to that, to just know like, I'm getting better at this, and I'm not sure when it's gonna be measurable exactly or how it's gonna be measurable, but I can tell that I'm starting to understand this, and I understand it better at the end of today's hour than I did at the end of yesterday's hour. Yeah, I think like I'm learning now with sports and like this trans this seems to transcend like a lot of different, this is what I tell myself at least so I can sleep better at night, mm -hmm. to transcend different um, industries or careers is that I think in athletics, like it seems like people are like chasing to be per uh, the perfect athlete, be the best, like always be the top of your game. And I've read mm -hmm. something recently where it's like, it's just the constant pursuit of mastery because yeah. you're never gonna be, it's never gonna be, there's always gonna be somebody better, stronger, right. faster, right. waiting. To yeah, and it's, and it's the pursuit of your own um, potential, of fulfilling your own potential, which I think we can all connect to in that, like, um, I probably didn't have the capacity to be as good as LeBron James at basketball. It's, it's possible that it's I'm possible. making excuses, but probably I just didn't quite have that. So if I could get to at least 98 or 99 percent of what was possible for me, then that seemed like a life success where when I'm on my deathbed, I can think, you know, I put everything I had into it. And yeah, I didn't turn out to be Larry Bird like I thought I was going to be when I was 12, but I turned out to be the best version of a professional basketball player that yeah. I could be. And similarly with writing or whatever else I will do in my life, if I can connect to that same sense, I think then I will look back at things as a success story. And I think that's, as we were kind of talking about um, childhood sports, the one thing that we can talk to kids about is like, and it sounds kind of hokey, right? Like, look, I know you're, you know, the eighth man on your seventh grade basketball team, right? <laughs> and it seems like this doesn't matter, but what matters is that when you're in the game, you're as hooked up and connected as you possibly can be, and that you will take this lesson for the thing that you maybe are better at and yeah. be able to maximize You'll find that ability. Where it right. Yeah. So, so when you're writing, mm -hmm. now at least, I'm assuming, you're not like hold up like, Carrie Bradshaw, Sex in the City, looking out the window <laughs> right. with a Cosmo. You actually, you opened up your own space. Yeah, so I, well, I um, realized 
kind of like you were saying about uh, training with other people, that I just do not like to write alone. So um, at the same time that I my what was going to be my second book failed, that was the moment when I realized like I am not working hard enough at writing. Like until now, it had been that romantic vision of like, oh, I just write when I yeah, feel like it. just crank it out, yeah. Um, and so these two things kind of happened about the same time. And I had a friend who ran a sandwich shop that was closed at night, and I was like, what if we like figured out if there were other writers who just would like to get together and write. And so was born this thing called Writer's Block, which is B-L-O-K, so that it's Googleable. And also because we're trying to kind of send the message that it's like a B-L-O-C, like a grouping of people, yeah, as like opposed to, right, as opposed <laughs> yeah. to like the writers, like the uh, stereotypical the writers block. blocking yeah. of your writing. So for like two years, it was just me taking wine and uh, like, propane space heater because it was he had an outdoor area uh to this sandwich shop just day or like sorry week after week monday night after monday night um and it took a long time for me to start to see like i think there's there might be something here uh so that grew into us being in several locations and then about a year ago as we're speaking we got a permanent home uh here in los angeles and now have our own space where we have a full schedule of writing sessions a lot like a yoga studio um, and we're finding that it's pretty successful for people. Like they they get a lot done, and we're growing really fast yeah, because of it. Yeah, that's super exciting. So you grew up in a small town. You said seven hundred people. Seven hundred people. It's pretty small. It's pretty small, but we were close to Topeka. Yeah, that's which the big is, city. You know, the, that's where we would go to town. There is in my notes that your mom was your high school sex ed teacher. Yes, what was that, that like is in, true. In a town of people. Yeah, it wasn't great. My mom, uh, the the story behind that is that um, she, my home act teacher, is like, so hey, uh, we're we're doing sex ed today. We're gonna take a break from funnel cakes or whatever. And, I loved home uh, ec. Yeah, home ec was great. <laughs> home ec was great. Uh, and I, being the kind of nerdy, really nerdy. Um, skinny kid who's afraid of girls and is very oh, underdeveloped. Oh, this is painful already. Uh, I'm like, oh <laughs> man, this isn't going to be good uh, because when the so like, teacher, don't worry, Polly, we brought your the mom teacher's like, about here's the sex ed teacher. And I knew it was my mom, of course, but I'm like, oh, well now everybody else knows that my mom is the sex ed teacher because she was the county nurse. Yeah, because um, there's no way to hide in, in a town of 700 people. You're like, who's this? Yeah, everybody this knows Shirley. who's who. So anyway, my mom comes in and, sh and I'm just sitting there like, please get just get through this, just Paul. Sweating. You're gonna be fine. Just like <laughs> stay eyes forward and like don't say anything. And uh, she was like, you know, if you're if as you age, you're gonna want to use condoms. Hormones so she's be like, doing their job. Yeah. Here's how a condom works. And so when I would tell the story, you know, 20 years later, I'd be like, so then my mom got out a banana and did the whole condom on a banana trick. And my mom stopped <laughs> me one time. She's like, Paul, no, that's not what I did. And I was like, oh, I must have made this worse in my brain, because that's what we do sometimes. <laughs> You're like, sorry, like, my trauma just lied yeah, to me anyways. Exactly. And <laughs> yeah. she goes, no, no, I just used my whole forearm. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's, I actually made it better in my head. I made it more palatable so that like, I could like manage it, right? So anyway, my mom's got a condom on her forearm and this Jesus. kid about five <laughs> people down from me goes, do better, son's never gonna get to use one of those. Because everybody knew I was the like shy kid who so, didn't like, talk to girls. Just like tears streaming down yeah, your face tears with just your little immediately, condom on the banana. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> like, <laughs> and I remember vividly that I was like, I started crying, but I put my head up like this because I was like, if the tears could just stay in the little lakes formed by my eye sockets, yeah. then no one would That's notice. That's science. The problem is that when they fill up, then your head comes forward and all the tears come onto your shirt. And uh, they stay there longer. The bell than rings, and you just race out of the room <laughs> and get to your locker as fast as possible and hope that the whole school burns down. Yeah, to cry in the bathroom like yeah. an adult. Right. right. <laughs> and really grow up with that. Stories I Tell on Dates, the podcast, mm -hmm. that was actually recommended to me like when I was like adventuring into the world of writing and like possibly doing a podcast. Oh, cool. Um, and that was like where I, even I had like contacted you after hearing some of your stories. Cause I actually, in college, I dated a guy that played overseas. So it was like a lot of your mm -hmm. stories, like just like we were talking about, it's very upsetting for people to find out that it's not just like a magical oasis of wonder right, when you right. um, play internationally. Yeah. So what, what, made, what prompted you to start the whole podcast and like start writing as far as stories I tell on dates? Um, Stories I Tell on Dates came about because I went on a bunch of dates where I realized I was telling the same stories over and over again. And I was kind of frustrated with myself because I was like, almost like going into material here. And I, like, I know <laughs> yeah, how like, this, this story works. Um, <laughs> you know how to that, work it, yeah. Yeah, and that 
is it seems kind of, it seems kind of duplicitous in a way. And then I realized like, no, we all do that. And it's not just dating. It's just in everyday life. We have certain stories like, for example, let's say we only had one leg. We get really used to telling people how yeah. that happened. And you have we the know, unemotional version. Yeah, we know the beats to hit and like the ways that it works. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just see. I feel like I have a lot of these. I'm gonna see how many of them are there are, and just started writing them down. Um, and when I got to 50, I was like, I, I might have something here. So let's like <laughs> figure out a way. I had never thought I would write a second memoir because how conceited is that? I know I was um, blown away. You're like, I was getting tired of them. I'm like, well, I guess you're not a narcissist. <laughs> like maybe you are. Maybe, like, 50. It's like, well. Yeah. <laughs> so I like whittled that down to like the 20 best, and whittled that down to like the 14 best, and then went through multiple rounds of editing. And a friend of mine who is a Actually, he's a moth storytelling champion. Do you know what the moth no. is? It's a, it sounds it's a, dusty. It's a, like, it's, a, <laughs> it's an event where people go to tell stories. He, gave, he was like, you need a way to tie this together. So that's where each chapter then became, it starts on a date. I explain why I would tell a particular story because I think we all also tell stories based on the context. Like, mm -hmm. how well do I know this person? Am I just sort of trying to make them laugh or do I really want to connect and I'm willing to then open up a little bit more? Um, and that's what made the book work, I think, was this through line of here's date one and here's the story I would tell. And then date two, et cetera. <laughs> You're like, when I really like them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's fair. And so then we, we realized like that it made sense to turn that into a podcast, like a serialized podcast, which is really just me telling these stories, telling the stories of the dates and then telling the stories I would tell on the dates. Um, and interestingly, uh, it's just like everything in entertainment. The book did okay and people liked it, but it really, I think, sung or sang. It really sang, sorry. <laughs> singed it, it please, really English. Singed, really <laughs> singed as a, as a podcast because I think there was something about the fact that it was just it's me telling these stories. Retirement from sport is a hard transition anyways. And I know mm -hmm. there's this Dwayne Wade commercial that recently came out. Mm -hmm. I was telling you briefly, I was just like ugly crying right before I went to the airport. It was mm -hmm. a good look. It was a good look. Right. I had like a messy braid. I just couldn't, I couldn't after couldn't that. Handle. I was, but he, he was mentioning, so he's retiring this year and he's mentioning that he's going to seek, um, like seek therapy, see a psychologist while he transitions into retirement. And mm -hmm. I think like for us as athletes, it's like, that seems like such a normal thing to do. Yeah, but for I sure. think like right now, like the news is they're like they're like, what do you think about that? And mm -hmm. it, um I did two years of like twice weekly therapy. Uh, I my text my therapist, them. like my sports psychologist. Yeah. On and the I'm regs. I still do therapy like once a month. Dude, um, got it. Yeah. And tuna. people people told me like you will have two years of depression when your career is over. And they were kind of right. Like it was about that number where it's hard. It's hard to have highs because like, you get that post Olympic games too, like post Paralympic oh, games. Bet, as yeah. you, it's like everything's great and there's just rainbows and puppy kisses everywhere. And then when it's mm -hmm. over, you're like I think it's somewhat similar where you're like there is that big slump. Yeah, it's I what my therapist said was that I was like the 65 year old who retired from State Farm Insurance and had unwittingly tied up most of his self-esteem to that job. And now he got home and was like, what am You're still I? still in your khaki pants right? and red polo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just that I was 32 or whatever. Yeah. And um, I think that adds to the weirdness because you are like, I feel old, but I'm not at all yet old. And in fact, I probably f look and feel younger than most people my age because I've been training so hard for yeah, so long. Yeah, I've exercised uh, regularly. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think that sets up a weird um, shift in your brain because you just don't know how to feel. You yeah. Just like, you're like, I don't, I honestly don't know how to exist in the world because I've connected so strongly to something that probably had to be an obsession if you're going to be really good at it. And now that's just a vacuum. It's gone now. It's right. gone. And that's, well, I feel like that's also like the ironic thing because we talk about sports as being, being applicable to so many things in life. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like when you get to a certain level, like it has to be everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. I do wonder if, you know, when we're younger, it, we're prone to obsess about things. And I think that may have, for me personally, I don't know for everybody, but it may have actually worked against me to be that obsessed with it. I think if I had backed it off just slightly, I actually might have been better. 
Yeah, I don't think you find athletes though at that level that like learn how to have chill unless like they're regularly seeing a psychologist. Yeah, yeah. I, but I but I do think that like that you, it's required to be that level of obsessive, but it may actually be better if you, Yeah, if you, you can, can relax take it down yeah. just a notch. Absolutely. That was like honestly when I started when I started therapy and I realized that you can be more than just just the athlete, mm -hmm. um, I became a better athlete, which is ironic. Yeah, yeah you yeah. learn to kind of like right. to, like loosen the grip just a little bit. Right. Um, exactly. All right, Paul, I want to thank you for stopping by. Thank you for having me. This was, this was, it was really great to finally get to sit down and talk with you. Yeah, this is different than tweeting at each other. That is true. It is, we got to use a lot more characters, mm -hmm. a lot more words this time mm -hmm. than on Twitter. <laughs> Thanks again, Paul, for coming. Thanks for having me. This was Pick Blast and Gym Class. Thanks for joining us for this week's show. You can check out the Pick Blast and Gym Class podcast for an extended conversation with Paul. Just head to dcpentertainment.com to listen and subscribe. 